Chapter 63. Guard. He hates his job. He hates the heat. He hates that he has to stand in front of the chop shop for hours guarding the doors, making sure no one unauthorised enters or leaves. He had dreams back in Stayho of starting a business with his buddies, but no one loans start-up money to Stayho kids. Even after he changed his last name from Ward to Mullard, the name of the richest family in town, he couldn't fool anyone. Turns out half the kids from his state home took on that name when they left, figuring they could outsmart the world. In the end, he outsmarted no one but himself. The best he could do was find a series of unfulfilling jobs in the year he's been out of stay ho. The most recent of which is being a harvest camp guard. On the roof, the band has started its afternoon set. At least that helps the time to pass a little more quickly. Two unwinds approach and climb the steps toward him. They're not being escorted by guards and both carry plates covered with aluminium foil. The guard doesn't like the look of them. The boy's a fleshhead. The girl is Asian. What do you want? You're not supposed to be here. We were told to give this to the band. They both look nervous and shifty. This is nothing new. All unwinds get nervous near the chop shop. And to the guard, all unwinds look shifty. The guard peeks under the aluminium foil. Roast chicken. Mashed potatoes. They do send food up to the band once in a while, but usually it's staff that carries the food, not unwinds. I thought they just had lunch. Guess not, says the fleshhead. He looks like he'd rather be anywhere in the world but standing in front of the chop shop, so the guard decides to draw it out, making them stand there even longer. I'll have to call this in, he says. He pulls out his phone and calls the front office. He gets a busy signal. Typical. The guard wonders which he'd get in more trouble for letting them bring the food in, or turning them away if they really were sent by administration. He considers the plate in the girl's hand. Let me see that. He peels back the foil and takes a large just chicken breast. Go in through the glass doors and the stairs are to your left. If I see you go anywhere but up the stairs, I'll come in there and trank you so fast you won't know what hit you. Once they're inside, they're out of sight, out of mind. He doesn't know that although they went into the stairwell, they never brought the food to the band. They just ditched the plates, and he never noticed the little round band-aids on their palms. Chapter 64. Connor. Connor looks out of the dormitory window, devastated. Lev is here at Happy Jack. How he got here doesn't matter. All that matters is that Lev will now be unwound. It's all been for nothing. Connor's sense of futility makes him feel like a part of himself has already been cut out and taken to market. Connor Lassiter? He turns to see two guards at the entrance. Around him, most of the kids have left the unit for their afternoon activity. The ones that remain take a quick glance at the guards and at Connor, then look away, busying themselves in anything that will keep them out of this business. Yeah? What do you want? Your presence is requested at the harvest clinic, says the first guard. The other guard doesn't talk. He just chomps on chewing gum. Connor's first reaction is that this can't be what it sounds like. Maybe Reese sent them. Maybe she wants to play something for him. After all, now that she's in the band, she has more influence than the average unwind, doesn't she? The Harvest Clinic, echoes Connor. What for? Well, let's just say you're leaving Happy Jack today. Chomp, chomp, goes the other guard. Leaving? Come on, son. Do we have to spell it out for you? You're a problem here. Too many of the other kids look up to you. And that's never a good thing at a harvest camp. So the administration decided to take care of the problem. They advance on Connor, lifting him up by the arms. No, no, you can't do this. We can, and we are. It's our job. And whether you make it hard or easy, it doesn't matter. Our job gets done either way. Connor looks to the other kids as if they might help him, but they don't. Goodbye, Connor, says one, but he won't even look in Connor's direction. The gum-chewing guard looks more sympathetic, which means there might be a way to get through to him. Connor looks at him pleadingly. Makes him stop chewing for an instant. The guard thinks for a moment and says, I got a buddy looking for brown eyes on account of his girlfriend. Don't like the ones he's got. He's a decent guy. You could do a lot worse. What? We sometimes get dibs on parts and stuff, he says. One of the perks of the job. Anyways, all I'm saying is I can give you some peace of mind. You know your eyes won't go to some low life or nothing. The other guard snickers. (laughs) Peace of mind. Good one. Okay, time to go. They pull Connor forward, and he tries to prepare himself. But how do you prepare yourself for something like this? Maybe what they say is right. 
Maybe it's not dying. Maybe it's just passing into a new form of living. It could be all right, couldn't it? Couldn't it? He tries to imagine what it must be like for an inmate to be led to his execution. Do they fight it? Connor tries imagining himself kicking and screaming his way to the chop shop. But what would be the use of that? If his time on earth as Connor Lassiter is ending, then maybe he should use the time well. He should allow himself to spend his final moments appreciating who he was. No, who he still is. He should appreciate the last breaths moving in and out of his lungs while those lungs are still under his control. He should feel the tension and release in his muscles as he moves and see the many sights of Happy Jack with his eyes and store them in his brain. Hands off me. I'll walk by myself, he orders the guards, and they instantly release him, perhaps surprised by the authority in his voice. He rolls his shoulders, cracks his neck, and strides forward. The first step is the hardest, but from that moment on, he decides that he will neither run nor dawdle. He will neither quiver nor fight. He will take this last walk of his life in steady strides, and in a few weeks from now, someone, somewhere, will hold in their mind the memory that this young man, whoever he was, faced his unwinding with dignity and pride.